Okay, so we're going to go on with John chapter 2. This is when the Lord Jesus turns water into wine, and water is the most common substance, isn't it? And yet, Jesus can turn it into something beautiful, into the, the very best wine. But let's just start with, uh, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, through the Lord, we come to you yet again to pray, Father, that you will speak to each of us through your word and in your Son, so that we might hear really how you wish to speak to us and how you wish us to be. And we pray that you'll give us the grace to respond to that and to believe in your huge grace and massive desire to save us. For the Lord's sake. Amen. Amen. Right, on the third day, verse 1, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Well, you can't just pick up the Bible and start reading at random. You always need to look at the context. And we looked yesterday at John chapter 1, and the Lord Jesus converts this guy called Nathaniel, who is from Cana of Galilee. And now you read about him being uh, at a wedding in Cana. So I think we're supposed to connect that. This, these chapter divisions that there are in the Bible were just put in by men, um, just to try to make the text a little bit easier to handle. The same the division into verses. This is not from God. This is just men trying to make the Bible a little bit uh, easier to handle. Now, as I say, at the end of chapter 1, Jesus has converted Nathanael from Cana in Galilee. And now he's at a wedding in Cana. So it seems to me that he has gone there in order to help Nathanael to witness to his immediate family. And I would assume that, to assume that this wedding is of Nathanael's relatives. And you see, that's what the Lord Jesus wants. He wants us to witness to our immediate circle of people around us. That's why the Gospel records say elsewhere that the Lord Jesus went to the towns and villages where the disciples came from, particularly there in those fishing villages around the Sea of Galilee. So that is actually the hardest witness, to actually witness to our own little circle of people around us, the people who actually know us. That is, that's a test of Christianity. You see, we have a mission. It's not a case of, oh yeah, well I need to be baptized because I'm a sinner, and yeah, so I want to get with God and that. Yes, that's good. But we are baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore one is the mouth, one is the leg, one is the finger, the thumb, etc. We all have a role. We are the light of the world. You see, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he said, you're the light of the world. So that is why and how the Lord will use you to illuminate, to be the light for people immediately around you. And the way the Lord Jesus seems to take the disciples when he calls them, but then he goes to where they came from, their families and so forth, to help them witness to those people. So I think that's why the Lord accepts this invitation to this wedding. And it says, verse 1, the mother of Jesus was there, Mary. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the marriage. I may be over-reading it, but I wonder if there's a slight tension there. Jesus had been invited to the marriage, to the wedding, but his mother was there. As if, you know, now her son, this is going to be his first miracle that John records, as if Mary is sort of, sort of snooping around and trying to, oh, my son is now famous throughout the country, so she's sort of tagging around with him. When they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Like, nudge, nudge, come on Jesus, come on, let's, let's have a miracle. And he said to her, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. That's not a nice way to talk to your mum, in a sense. You don't call your mum woman, you know? You don't go around to your mum's flat and say, ah, uh, oh, woman, uh, what have you got for me to eat? <laughs> no, you don't talk to your mum like that. You talk with respect. You're a half-decent sort of bloke anyway. And you get this again when he dies on the cross, when he says, woman, behold your son. And he means, John, I'm dying, mum. I'm not going to be your son in that sense, but woman, that's your son, John, there, he'll look after you. And so you see there the kind of tension between the two of them. She's like, come on, knock a miracle up. Come on, Jesus, don't go any wine. I've run out of wine. Come on, come on, notch, notch. 
Oh, it's a miracle. And he says, but my hour has not yet come. And you wonder what that means. Well, in John's Gospel, my hour, and my hour coming and so forth, is always to do with is always to do with his death on the cross. So I think he's saying, uh, no, my hour has not yet come to die. Because uh, when he does come to the cross, he says, well, the hour has come. Son of man must go as was written of him. So his hour, his time coming, he always understood as his time to die on the cross. So let's just, you know, when you read the Bible, you've got to read it slowly, you've got to read it carefully. Doesn't, it's not rocket science, it's just slowly reading it and rereading it. So, there's no wine. Now, wine typically is, was red. Right? So, there's no wine. Mum says, come on Jesus, get him some wine. You give him some wine. And he's thinking on a different level. He says, no, my time to die has not yet come. You see, as soon as there was talk about wine, he thinks, oh, my, my blood. You see, that's why we take the juice, the wine, as it were, as a symbol of his blood. So you can see what's going on, that he thinks straight away um, in terms of my, uh, my, my blood. As soon as she says, oh, come on, give him some wine. Oh, no, it's not time for me to pour my blood out yet. And this is typical, you see it particularly in John's Gospel, that Jesus talks on one level, but people understand on another. For example, he is with the uh, Samaritan woman at the well, and he's hungry, but he has this wonderful conversation with this Samaritan woman. And the disciples come and bring him some food, and he says, oh, no, I've got food to eat that you don't realise. And they say, oh, did somebody bring him some food already? And of course, what he means is, my conversation with this woman, that's my food. Wow, I'm, I'm good. Uh, but, oh, no, they're worried about physical food. Where, but he's talking about spiritual food. Like when he says, if you want to have life, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the Jews are like, oh no, we're not cannibals. We can't, we, we can't eat your flesh. So time and again, you see that he talks on one level, but they understand on, on a literal level. He's on a spiritual level, they're on a literal level. You just see this all the time. And here's a classic example. Come on, Jesus, give him some wine. Oh, no, the time to pour my blood out hasn't come yet. Yeah? And this is how we are in this world. It's not that we are better than or higher than other people in the sense that we are all sinners, right? But the idea definitely is that I am simply uh, a, a believer in the Lord Jesus and I'm thinking on a different level. On a, I'm seeing life differently. You know, you walk down that high street there and you're assailed by all sorts of temptations, images, ideas, etc. You see that on one level, but the world sees it on another. Yeah? And so this is what it means to have the gift of the Holy Spirit, a holy mind, a spirit, a pair of eyes, a worldview, a psychology, put it whatever way you want, a spirit, summing up that looks at life differently so that when you are in the supermarket and you see that wall of alcohol, that wall of alcohol, beer, wine, vodka, spirits, whiskey, oh, this is on special, that's on special, just a couple of quid, I could buy that bottle, you know? No, you look at that differently. Oh, yeah, that's just a load of bottles. Um, I was here to, um, I don't know, to buy some potatoes, <laughs> or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, you know, but people who are alcoholics say, oh, no, how, how can I look at this differently? Yeah, you can't, because you can't reprogram yourself. You, there's no buttons on the end of your, your head that you can press to sort of reprogram your thinking. You need this new spirit, this just new way of looking at life. And that is why I encourage people to be baptised into the Lord Jesus so that they might receive the gift of the Spirit. As the Lord says, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so, they've run out of wine. If it was me, and uh, you know, I, I've thought about this story quite a lot, if it was me, I'd have said, yeah, well, you've all had quite enough to drink, guys. 
I won't be giving you any more. Um, it's like if a drunk person comes up to you and says, oh, could, 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 could you just buy me another drink? You're like, I don't think so, mate. But he does this. And, uh, so we, we're going to go through it. Um, his mother said to the servants, whatever he commands you, do it. So there's servants there, and I will come back to them in a minute. Nearby, there were six stone water pots placed there for the Jewish custom of purifications, each holding 75 to 115 litres. So these are massive, massive stone water pots. I mean, to carry 100 litres of water, you know, one litre weighs one kilogram, you know, one bloke couldn't carry one of those water pots. You'd need a couple of blokes to carry it. Very, very big. So, what were these water pots doing there? And it says the Jews used them for purification. Well, that means, as I understand it, that there they were at a party, at a wedding party. They had all drunk uh, quite enough. Oh, but uh, you had these big, uh, the, these big water pots with some water in them so that you could just cleanse yourself. Oh yes, let me just get some water, scoop it out, pour it on my hands, or oh, I've defiled myself. Oh, now I'm good. Right, ritual, ritual, the, the Jewish custom or the Jewish ritual of purification. Now that, of course, is not going to save you. That is mere religion. And that is not even there in the law of Moses. That, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to have a party, we're going to get drunk. Oh, now let's have these uh, water pots. So, oh yeah, if I do anything naughty, um, oh well, I can just get some water, pour it on myself and I'm good. But no, that's ritual. So I say, that's the stuff that Catholicism and Orthodoxy is full of. Oh, whoopsie, you did a bit of a sin. Oh, that's all right. Just touch this or, or touch that and, and you're good. It's not like that. Well, Jesus says, fill them with water up to the brim, like absolute maximum absolute maximum and he said to the servants draw this out and take it to the master of the feast so they took it now they didn't uh, carry the whole water pot so I say it would have weighed 100 litres let's say would have been like 100 kilograms <clears throat> no they would have taken it out put it in a smaller flask or container and then poured that out Now, <clears throat> when the master of the feast tasted the water, which had now become wine, not knowing where it came from, but the servants that had drawn the water knew, he called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and when all have drunk freely, serve something inferior, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now, I keep saying that, you know, we're reading all this in translation, English translation. And the... the uh, behind all these English words, there are Greek words. And, you know, no one can ever translate from one language to another kind of perfectly. And so when it says the, the, uh, the governor, the, the uh, master of the wedding, the sort of master of ceremonies, he says, well, normally you put out the best wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the, the, the cheaper wine. But it's, when it says they, when they've drunk freely, it does literally mean when they are drunk. When people are drunk, then you bring out the cheaper wine and no one's going to realise this is cheaper. So you could argue from that that the people are in fact um, drunk, that they're, they're actually drunk. And yet Jesus still makes more wine. And as I've said, that is not something that I, I would do. Sorry. That's not something that I would do. I would have said, no, no, you, I'm not making any more wine, I'm not giving you any more wine, you're ready. As the master of ceremonies says, you've drunk freely, you're already drunk. And I thought a lot about this, why did Jesus do this? Because it's, it's, it's a bit strange to me. Um, and I concluded this, that the whole purpose of it was in order that the servants, the slaves who were just running around, pouring the, the wine out, so that they would know. Actually, nobody knew what had happened. That the water had been turned into wine, and even the, the master of the feast is saying, where did all this wine come from? Doesn't know. 
But later the man would have thought, where did all this wine come from? I guess from that Jesus. And it's so beautiful, the way God works, very subtly. Very subtly. And so he says, <clears throat> um, you've kept the good wine until now. He doesn't understand. And nobody knows, verse 9, nobody knew where it came from. Only the servants knew. So the whole purpose of this miracle was in order to show those servants, wow, he can turn water into wine, and he did it. Now, this is typical of how God seeks to convert just a few, it seems to me. Yeah, the witness is there for the world, but in fact only a very few come to actually understand. And the rest of the people in this whole story, the people at the wedding, etc., well, in that sense, Jesus was not concerned with them. His, the point of the miracle was to persuade and to show to just a few people. Yet it says in verse 11 that this, the first of his signs, it means his miracles, uh, that had sign value to them, uh, he did in Cana, thereby revealing his glory, and his disciples believed in him. How did he reveal his glory? Nobody at the feast knew what had happened. Only the servants knew. So he revealed his glory, not to everyone, but just to those slaves. They were probably not servants, but slaves. Just to them. And it's the same. In one sense, God reveals his glory all over the earth. You look at the sunrise, the sunset, the beauty of nature. You can see his glory. We can see it, but most people do not see it. Most people do not see it. And I'm afraid it's hard to draw any other conclusion, but that God is working with a minority. Well, whatever ethical issue you have with that, the fact is that you and me are that minority. You know? You think of all those millions, billions of people who lived, let's say, in China years ago, never heard the name of Jesus Christ. People who lived in this country thousands of years ago never heard the name of Jesus Christ. But for some reason, we are in that minority who did, out of all the zillions of people who lived on this planet. So, <clears throat> just thinking a little bit about actually what would have happened. You see, there were six water pots, each holding 75 to 115 litres each. Let's call it 100. So, if six water pots fill to the brim with water, suddenly it's all high quality wine. And by high quality, of course, what they mean was high alcohol content. Uh, that's, that's 600 litres of wine. That's a massive amount of wine. 600 litres of wine. That is just massive, like, fill this, you know, place with, with it all. And the people have already, they're already drunk. Inevitably, a lot of it would have been left over. And people would have marveled at the supreme generosity of Jesus. That's why he says, fill it up to the brim. Not just a little bit, right up to the brim. So you see this super abundance, which is a, a characteristic of how God operates. It's like when the Lord Jesus fed the 5,000, etc. There was so much that they took up 12 baskets full of, full of fragments left over. He was super generous. And yet people think that God is mean. He didn't give me enough. Well, his provision for us in Jesus Christ is absolutely massive. Absolutely generous as to our real need, which is for his blood. Now, back to these servants. You see, the water pots are massive. As I say, let's say they had 100 litres in each. That's like 100 kilograms of high quality, high alcohol content wine. They couldn't carry these massive water pots and pour them out into people's cups, no way. They would have had to, I don't know, put some sort of uh, flasher or tumbler into the water pots and, and fill that with wine and then go and pour that out into people's cups. And it reminds me of when the Lord Jesus 
feeds the 5,000 and so on. He feeds the 5,000 and then he tells the disciples, you take this to them, to the crowds. There's always this kind of mechanism that he uses. He does something, but he works through the disciples on a human level to share it out. With the bread and the fish. Yeah, okay, he did the miracle, but the disciples then take it to the people. And it's the same here. He does the miracle, turns the water into wine, there's masses of it, at least 600 litres of high quality wine to give to people who have already drunk quite enough wine. But he works through the disciples. And it's the same with us. You see, God has put in our hands the power to save people. He really has. But how does he get out there, as it were, onto the streets of Croydon and actually win men and women to himself? It is to us. And if we don't do it, in that sense it doesn't happen. You could say, oh, well, God can do anything, he makes someone else do it, well, possibly so, but the point is that he also may not. That if you entrust somebody with a task and they don't do it, well, if they don't do it, it is not done. That's the first thing you find. You start employing people in a, on any level. You're taking a chance, you're, in, you're trusting them to do a job. And if they don't do it, well, it is not done. And it is as simple as that. And in a sense, that is how it is with God and, and with us. And so, <clears throat> people don't understand the wonder of what is going on. You know? And yet, God works in a very, very subtle and beautiful way. Because after all this had happened, after all the drunk people had gone home, I'm sure... The, the master of the uh, feast would have looked at the uh, water parts and thought, whoa, these are full of this high quality wine. How did that get there? He would have scratched his head and thought, that must be Jesus. Now, who was this master of the feast? You see, it was nine. The master of the feast tasted the water, which had become wine, didn't know where it came from. Well, in the next chapter, and as I said at the start, you've got to read the Bible chronologically, there's a bloke called Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. And Jesus says to him, verse 10, Are you the teacher of Israel? And King James says, are you the master? I think. That's the word, the master. You're the master of Israel, but you don't understand these things. So I just wonder whether Nicodemus was this master and again you see Jesus is nudging him and then next chapter chapter 3 after this Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night yeah because the Lord had done this amazing miracle and if this is so what I'm suggesting Nicodemus was the master of the feast he would have when he was clearing up or his guys were clearing up wow the six water parts are filled with this high quality wine how did that happen? It must have been that Jesus from Nazareth. And so next chapter, by night, because he didn't want anyone to know that he was interested in Jesus, just like people today, by night, he comes to Jesus. And he says, no one can do the miracles you do unless God is with you. But the only miracle in John, anyway, that has been done by that point is this miracle with the wine. And nobody knew about it at the time. But you see how God works in a very subtle and, if you like, indirect way. Um, it's a beautiful way. It, it's not, you know, sort of mass flash miracles. And in any case, they don't persuade people. Don't you? Because Israel had miracle after miracle every day in the wilderness, and they still didn't believe. They had, you know, manna, they had water gushing from the rock. They were led by the pillar of fire at night and the pillar of cloud in the daytime. And yet they still didn't believe. It is this more subtle way. And if you look in your life, you may think, oh, I don't see no miracles here. No, you won't see no miracles in that you know, sense, I, I doubt. But God does at times do some amazing things. But it's this subtle, indirect way of working that leads you 
to that conclusion that, wow, this is him. So, we said that the wine represents the blood of Jesus. And as soon as Mary says, come on, Jesus, yeah, do a miracle, knock the wine out, give him some wine. He's like, oh no, my time to die on the cross hasn't yet come. My time to pour my blood out hasn't come. So he made a very strong connection in his mind between blood and his blood and the wine. And so we take that and we're asked to make that same connection to see in this cup his blood. To share his mind. That's the whole thing I said earlier. That this is what it is to be a Christian. This is the goal of it all. It's to have the mind of Christ, to the mind of the Lord Jesus, to have his spirit. There's a whole purpose and experience of eternity, in fact, is to live with that spirit forever. And we, you know, eternity in that sense starts now. So let's, uh, let's just start with a prayer. No, sorry, let's, uh, let's just give a prayer for the, uh, the emblems. Heavenly Father, we thank you with all our heart for your Son, our Lord, and our Master, and our Saviour. We thank you for his blood, the symbol of which we take here, and for his body, the symbol of which we also see in the bread. And we pray that really he will become part of us, and that we will be in that minority, it seems, who get it, who see your movement and your work behind the scenes in our lives in order to save us. For his sake. Amen. Amen.